Hi, everybody. Roy Oppenheim here. We're at Zoom at noon. We changed the format a little today because Jeff Sherman, my partner, is going to be joining us as we talk about return of evictions and foreclosures during COVID-19. Uh, I think this is week 27 that we have now done this week after week. If, uh, if I'm wrong, someone can correct me. Um, again, this is sponsored by our law firm, Oppenheim Law, as well as our title company, Weston Title. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Um, as many of you know, we uh, were founded in 1989 and we're in the thick of things during the last foreclosure crisis, uh, during uh, the economic crisis of 2008 and uh, represent thousands of people in foreclosure. And of course, this crisis is a bit different. Little did we know that this was going to be, or that was going to be our training ground for what we're about to, uh, to experience uh, both collectively as a community. Now, this crisis, of course, is much more complicated because it's not just an economic crisis, but as I've said, also a health crisis and also somewhat of a, of a social crisis as, as we try and find that the true identity of, uh, of our nation. Um, we can go to the next slide. I, I want to thank, as usual, uh, those people who helped make this possible. Ellen Polowski, my my partner and my wife, Jeff, who helped put this presentation together today, and of course, as a guest speaker, Mia Singh, our, our senior attorney who's involved with, with probate and commercial litigation, Wayne Patton of counsel, who does our, our trust and estates, as, as, as well as our asset protection, and then uh, Paolo Vergara, who's of counsel, who does uh, our trademark intellectual property. I also want to thank, again, Lance Oppenheim, my son, for helping put this slide deck together today. Jeff has been with the firm for uh, approximately 13 years. He started off uh, while he was in, in at Nova as a, as a second year uh, law student and has been with us ever since and, and is now a partner with the firm. He is also a general counsel to the title company, Weston Title, that's been very, very busy, as, as many of you know, with refinances and people buying and, and selling homes during this, this crisis. And of course, he was uh, uh, the head person uh, defending foreclosures during the foreclosure crisis. So it's actually perfect for Jeff to, uh, to join us today. Jeff, would you say hello, please? Hey, Roy, thanks for having me today. <laughs> Great, so, so stay on as we go through this so you can chime in uh, as, you, as you would like to. Um, Sounds good. Go to the next slide, please, thank you. Uh, one more. So, you know, we've been talking, last week we, we talked about how mortgages rates are, are dropping and how there's just this craze for people to refinance. And of course, using the low mortgage rates to fuel a, a, a residential real estate market where it's now a seller's market. And we also talked the week before that about this K-shaped recovery. And if we look at the K, Jeff, if you can just, just scroll over to the K, there's at the top, uh, the, the, there, there are two prongs to the K. And the, the top prong is the prong where people are buying and selling real estate and refinancing. And the bottom prong is what we're going to talk about today. Those people who, who, are, who are in the process of facing eviction, those people who are being foreclosed, as well as landlords who can't collect rent and, and, and lenders that are having trouble collecting uh, their interest payments. And, and there are two sides of this coin. And, and, and the last time while we, we were primarily representing folks that were in foreclosure, this time around, we're representing the mom and pop landlords as well as the mom and pop lenders uh, because th there's really, no villain here. I mean, the villain is, is an existential threat that, that exists as a virus. It's not like the big bad banks. So the narrative is very, very different. Uh, but this chart's very interesting. And it kind of shows you, uh, just for a second, the top part of the K shape. And we see here that, that literally the top 1% of, of folks uh, that own stocks and mutual funds, they, they now own almost close to 55 or 50%. And we see from 1990, there's almost a steady curve. I mean, there've been, there've been bumps. Of, of how that percent has continued to increase of all the stock owned in, 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 in the public markets, the, the top 1% now own almost 50% or, or above 50% of all that, of all, of all shares issued. While back in 1990, it was, it was, you know, 40, 40, 35 per percent. And so that's a problem because what we're seeing is, is that the, the, the bottom K is growing as the top K is growing. And what we really want is, is something, more where where the, the disparity wouldn't wouldn't be as, as great and, and it causes social consequences that, that we're facing as a nation right now next next slide please so as you can well appreciate that there are a lot of stores and businesses that are going out of business a lot of people therefore are unemployed unemployment was a 10 some odd percent and now it's it's you know at least in florida it's dropped uh, maybe to nine or eight percent but that has a great impact of course on foreclosures and evictions next slide 
Uh, the good news on the job growth side is that we are seeing uh, some growth in certain areas here. We have a list of where there have been, has been growth. Mining and logging is the only place that, that is still losing jobs. Utilities is even. Wholesale trade is, is come back. Of course, the big winner so far is that the governments have brought people back from furlough. Retail trade stores are opening around the country. We'll see that some areas, uh, things are almost back to normal or, or really haven't been as affected like they have been on the coasts or, or uh, in other parts of the country. Leisure and hospitality has picked up some jobs, but certainly not as many jobs as have been lost. And that's why we have this eviction and foreclosure crisis before us. Next page. Uh, interestingly, in terms of the economy, we're seeing uh, hordes of people coming down from many parts of the United States to Florida. This is Meisner, there's a front page story in the New York Times just I think on Saturday about how folks are literally coming down in droves from the Northeast, from New York and other places. Uh, unfortunately, Florida will be the big winner at the end of this, uh, but for the time being, we still have to deal with the evictions and foreclosure and what impact that's going to have on both markets. Next, next, next page. Um, let me see, we have a chat here, someone's posting. Uh, someone has a question, we might as well ask it. And if we run over, we'll run over, we may just run this over into next week. So we're not gonna you know, push as fast as we sometimes do because there are just a lot of issues here that I wanna get to. I do have a question about selling a rental property and my tenant refuses to leave after giving her a 30 day notice and also her lease has expired from February. Uh, Jeff, you wanna take a crack at that? I mean, the, the lease is over. Um, we've given her 30 days notice. Can we get that person out right now? Yes, you <laughs> could get that person out now. Um, there's no restriction on getting that person out based on several of the moratoriums. I mean, considering that there is no lease agreement because the tenancy has now expired, that's right. one way to get it. It's not a non-payment issue. Right, so even if they have COVID and they, and they do it under the new CDC stuff that we're gonna talk about, they still don't necessarily meet that criteria, correct? Correct. Right. The problem is going to be actually getting the, the sheriff to issue a writ of possession. And, and, and there are different sheriff's offices around the state, particularly Dade and Broward, maybe Palm Beach, that are somewhat reluctant to, to evict anyone right now. And so that's just a public policy issue and not even a legal issue because there really aren't that many uh, uh, eviction writs being issued. Am I, am I correct on that or, or would you say that that's an overstatement, Jeff? I'd say that's a fair statement, right? Next slide. Infection spikes in colleges and communities. We're just talking about COVID here a little bit and its impact on different communities. What we're seeing is that the college communities and counties which have colleges are, are spiking much higher than those counties that don't have, have, have colleges, uh, the communities. And, and we're seeing here are the gray is, uh, is generally other counties other than, than counties that have colleges. The, co the counties that have colleges are seeing a higher rate of, of infection. And, and, and that's gonna be a, a real problem come Thanksgiving if, if these students go home and infect their parents and grandparents. And so that's, that's really the big concern. I know some colleges are being draconian and, and they're, they're literally expelling students uh, from, from school and asking them never to return for violating social, social policy, social distancing policies or not wearing masks or, or holding parties that they're not supposed to be holding. I mean, I, I think it, you know, one of the reasons you go to college is to party. So, I mean, it's somewhat of an oxymoron what's going on right now, but, but you know, the, the whole world is somewhat upside down and, and so are colleges. Uh, next slide, please. Colleges with uh, virus cases since the pandemic began. So we can see they're spotted all over the place. We're seeing that there's a heavy concentration to some extent in the Northeast and, and, and uh, maybe in the Carolinas. And then you have entire parts of the, the, the country where it's, it's very spotty. Of course, you have concentrations against, uh, again on the East Coast. And this is colleges with viruses. Now I want you to go to the next slide if we can, which is very interesting. These are the actual uh, cases uh, where there are flare-ups and the red areas are flare-ups. We looked at this last week, but what's interesting is we see the white areas, Wyoming, Montana, Nevada, Utah, Colorado. We're seeing entire states that um, uh, really don't have major, major flare-ups. And, uh, and then of course you see the East Coast isn't too bad. And of course now the central part of the, the country uh, is, is, is flaring up uh, in the Chicago Kentucky areas, Tennessee, Florida is doing better. And then of course you have the West Coast. So it's kind of an interesting uh, situation. A lot of folks from the East Coast are doing road trips to uh, uh, the mountains uh, because for the time being, um, you know, things are, are better there and they can be outdoors more. Next slide. Uh, where new cases are higher and staying high, may, maybe some of you have seen this, North Dakota has seen a spike, South Dakota, even Guam, Iowa, Tennessee, Kentucky, Illinois, South Carolina, Louisiana. A lot of these places have seen spikes, but they're coming down slightly too. Even Hawaii has, has gone up a little bit and makes the chart. Next, next slide. Uh, new reported cases in Florida continuing to drop. What's interesting is that the hot spots are in the panhandle. And of course, uh, you have some colleges in that area. And so there, there could be some correlation there. 
Uh, it could also be that people didn't take it as seriously early on. And so uh, as, as we've started to do better down here, uh, it's just natural that, that the virus would, would go to areas where people haven't, haven't been socially conditioned as we have been down here. Next slide. Return of evictions and foreclosures. Uh, I'll continue, but Jeff, if you want to chime in, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Uh, a house divided as millions of Americans face eviction. Others buy dream homes during COVID-19. We, we talked about the buying of homes and, and that part of the top part of the K here, we're gonna announce to focus, we're gonna start to focus really on the, on the bottom part of the, the K. And so we're looking at 20% at of renters are, are behind as, as it breaks down into demographic groups. Uh, uh, Blacks, African-Americans are, 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 are almost a third of, of all, uh, all a third of all black Americans are behind on their rent. Latinos, 26%. Other multiracial, 22, white, not Latino, 14, Asian, not Latino, 11%. So, so this is hitting particularly hard on minority population. And, and it's, it's unfortunate because uh, it's the people who sometimes are, 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 are needing the most help or we're, we're getting hit the hardest here. And it's a, uh, it's a situation that, that we all have to address collectively as a community. Next page. Uh, this shows you uh, the rate of delinquency on mortgages. And so, to put it simply, the rate has doubled from 3.6 in May 2019 to 7.3 uh, in May this year. It says it's a 3.7% increase, but it's really a 100% increase, over 100% increase of 3.6. 3.6 times 2 is, is 7.2. We're at 7.3, and that was May. That's not June, July, or August. We'll have those numbers sooner, sooner than later. But as we're seeing, um, uh, you know, we're having issues, issues uh with, with what's gonna to happen to those foreclosures. And, and Jeff, why, why don't we talk a little bit about what the implications are gonna be for um, you know, foreclosures going forward and what you're seeing in, at the foreclosure courts. Sure. Uh, I definitely see, obviously, right now there's not gonna be a lot of foreclosure cases, new ones filed. I'd say probably towards the beginning of next year, for Q1 probably is when you'll see a big influx of new cases being filed. Uh, right now, the courts are being cautious, obviously, with the CARES Act and other moratoriums in effect. They won't proceed cases for the most part unless it's a private loan where the investor is not covered underneath one of those uh, orders, whether it's the CARES Act or the CDC order or an FHA, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, HUD um, moratorium. So we're, we're going to start going over these different moratoriums, but we have really three sets of moratoria. We have executive orders from the governor. We have the CDC that came up with something brand new recently that we're gonna talk about. And then you had the moratoriums that the federal government had as it relates to Fannie and Freddie that, that you've already addressed. Jeff, we have, a, we have some questions here. Jeff, how do you overcome evictions if you're out of a job and out of income? That's a tough one. I mean, obviously right now, I'll go over the different moratoriums that are in effect with Florida, the CDC order, and also the Fannie Freddie. There may be ways to stop an eviction right now However, down the road, that's going to be difficult for you guys to try and resolve those issues. I always recommend to my clients to contact their landlord and try and make some sort of effort or reasonable effort to make some sort of payment arrangement with them so you can stay in your home and not get uh, evicted in, in the near future. But even if you can stay in your home, you're, you still will owe the back rent unless the landlord somehow waives it. And so eventually you could be evicted even though you, you were able to stay in the home during this crisis for owing the back rent if the landlord so chooses to to have you, uh, you know, be thrown out. That's Isn't correct. that right? That's right, okay. right. So let, let, I, there's a question here and then I wanna get back to, uh, to something you and I were talking about earlier. Um, uh, it's a two part question. Do you think there is a buying boom in real estate? And the answer is, uh, if we're talking about residential real estate, in some cases, yes, particularly single family homes in those communities that, that, that you know, may have good schools and that there's good spacing and that the taxes aren't too high. Certainly Florida, there's definitely, definitely a boom. You know, other parts of the country, it's really going to be hit or miss depending on, on what those communities offer. If you're talking about major cities, no, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, a buyer's market for sure uh, in, in, in major cities because so many people are, are leaving large cities because of spacing issues and work from home issues. The second question, uh, the people buying may still lose their job. Do you see a foreclosure crisis again? And do you think we should wait to invest until after the pandemic? Uh, Jeff, you want to start with that one? We're obviously going to see a crisis uh, in the near future, I think, yes, with foreclosures. I mean, if you're buying for investment purposes, I'd probably tell you to wait a little bit just because, uh, yes, you'll probably see a, a collapse in the market again when these houses go into foreclosure. There'll probably be short sales again if there's no equity in these homes. 
Uh, so I'd probably wait a little bit to invest if that's your goal. I mean, I mean, if, you know, it's kind of interesting. I was talking to Jeff about this. You know, if you're buying real estate to invest, that means you're looking for rent. And if the CDC can legally stop you from collecting rent, then the question is, is that really the best kind of investment as opposed to being able to buy something where you don't have to worry about some emergency agency being able to legally uh, tell you that you can't collect your rent. And I think that's one of the reasons why while the stock market hasn't been doing okay for the last few days. We've seen this run up since March. And, and I think, you know, historically, at least in our lifetimes, we never had a situation where the government says you can't collect mortgage, mortgage. Well, right. I, I think you're misspoken there with the CDC order. We'll go over that in a little bit. It's not that you cannot collect rent. It's just that you cannot evict somebody for failure to pay rent. Right. So, so they don't pay the rent. Okay. Okay. So they still owe the rent, but it may not be able to evict somebody right now until December 31st. If they, right. So, so you may be able to evict them. Okay. But, but from someone, from a, from a mom and pop landlord, if you can't collect the rent now and you, and you, and you can only collect it later and you have to keep them there, you may be able to evict them later, but the likelihood that you're going to collect that back rent is, is, is rather nominal if the person can't pay the rent now. So from an investment perspective, I would suggest that someone would be waiting till um, there are foreclosures and, and a situation where rents may drop because a lot of people will end up being evicted. And so rents may, may come down, which would then bring down the value of multifamily homes. Right now, uh, the problem is, is that if you were to be foreclosed and you, you were, why don't you talk about the issue about if someone's foreclosed, where do they go? What do they do? That's the issue. I mean, I've talked to clients also where they had foreclosure sales set before the pandemic hit and obviously those sales got canceled. Uh, but in the meantime, they were, before then they were looking for places to rent. Now that sales are starting to come back up again now and courts are issuing these sales out 35 days, 45 days out, they're looking for places to rent and there's no place to rent because the tenants who are in those investment properties are not paying the rent and they can't evict them either, the landlords, so there's no place to really move to. Uh, so I look at it kind of like musical chairs and everyone's sitting in a chair and the guy who gets foreclosed doesn't have a chair while ordinarily in a normal residential market where there are evictions that are occurring and there's just a normal ebb and flow of, of a market, people are, there are vacancies and those vacancies would go to some extent to people who've been foreclosed. In the last crisis, many people who were foreclosed, they would rent the same house or they'd rent the house across the street that was vacant. That opportunity doesn't exist this time around. There is no opportunity to, to really rent something comparable for your needs. And so because of that, you know, you, you could have a homeless situation which becomes a health crisis. And that is the reason why the CDC is saying that in some cases where it's COVID related, we don't want people to, to be evicted. Uh, there's another question here. Uh, how's the court system going to be able to deal with the enormous amount of evictions and foreclosures? Will most investors and landlords go bankrupt? And it's a two part question. Jeff, I'll let you take both, both parts. Uh, as far as the court system being able to handle the enormous amount of evictions and foreclosures, I'm not sure how they're gonna be able to handle the eviction portion of it. The foreclosures, I think the courts are pretty much equipped at this point. They, before COVID came about, they pretty much cleared their dockets. The process goes a lot faster. Uh, they should be capable to handle those cases going forward post COVID. As far as the evictions go, that's gonna be a whole different story because normally people are gonna start making these defenses about COVID uh, with the CDC order that's going to delay the process potentially, I think. Okay. And let, let's go through that CDC or, but, but before well, that, I, I, I'm sorry. No, and, we'll, we'll, and, we'll, and we'll get there. But what I do want to say is, is that last time around the banks learned the lesson that by bringing too many foreclosures at one time, they flooded the market and they reduced the value of their own book value because the real estate they were holding diminished in value. I think this time around, they're going to try and do workouts. They're going to try and get government bailouts that, that bail not just them out, but also their, their, their borrowers out so that we don't see this massive decline in value. But there will be some equilibrium where prices will stop going up and will probably start to come down once the foreclosure market becomes a headwind for the current real estate market. Uh, in terms of will most investors and landlords go bankrupt? Uh, it depends on, on how much dry powder they have. It depends what workouts that a landlord can do with their mortgage company. If, if, if they're getting pressure from their mortgage company to pay uh, the mortgage payment and they are not collecting their rents, there are going to be more bankruptcies. And yes, we have been handling those with, with, with a, a law firm that, that we're very close with and tied to. And so we're seeing a lot more uh, bankruptcies in, in that particular area, particularly in the sub chapter five of the 11. That, we've, that we have talked about in, in, in prior Zooms at noon. Uh, 
Uh, someone's asking, should I sell my home before buying a new one? Um, Jeff, uh, you, you can answer that. I mean, you could try and sell your home before you buy a new one, but you obviously want to be someplace to move after you sell your home. So you got to look to see timing wise, if that makes sense for you. I mean, in the past, people would say, you know, don't, don't buy a new place till you sell your old one. But this time around, there could be a risk that you may not find something this time around and you'll then wish you hadn't sold your home. And it, 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 and it gets dicey. So you have to be very, very careful this time around. I originally lost my job. Can I back out of buying a house without forfeiting my one or 2%? First of all, most times people are putting down 5%, but if you're only putting down 1% or 2%, that's great. And the answer is, uh, it depends. If, if you didn't get a, a mortgage, uh, if, it was a, if it was contingent on getting a mortgage and you didn't get the mortgage, then you don't qualify and you get your deposit back. But if it was a cash deal, there's a good chance you could lose your, your, your deposit. Uh, okay, let's go to the next slide, Jeff. Serious delinquency in metropolitan areas. This map just shows where we're gonna have at the crisis uh, first when, when the courts do open up. We're seeing, other, again, Southern California. It's, it's the same hot spots like last time around, the New York metropolitan area, New Jersey, and of course, uh, Florida as, as usual. Um, and this is a 90, 90 plus delinquency. Okay, so let's talk about the Florida moratoriums. Jeff, let's go over this real carefully here. We're probably gonna go over in time, but let's, let's, let's do it, okay? All right, right now, Governor DeSantis has a issued some executive orders. One was issued back, there was a couple more terms beforehand, back on uh, July 29th, he issued executive order 2180, which amended the prior ones. And it's very important because this amendment, beforehand it was ambiguous as to whether or not they could, um, banks or landlords could file evictions, if it was commercial versus residential. This amended it to make it very clear that it's only for residential properties. Uh, so basically the statute tolls any statute providing for a final action, which means that they can now file foreclosures and eviction actions, um, but only when the proceeding is solely, when the proceedings arise from non-payment to the mortgage or rent by a single family mortgage or a residential tenant that's adversely affected by COVID-19. Adversely affected means loss of employment, diminished wages, business income, or any mo monetary loss uh, as a result of the Florida emergency impacting the ability of them to make their either their mortgage payments or rental payments. But if you were in foreclosure or eviction before COVID, right, before that what, doesn't, March? That doesn't apply. So they can continue on, go to a foreclosure judgment or eviction judgment and evict you from the property or sell your property. But if, anyone, if, so, if anyone's in foreclosure or eviction or if a landlord brought the foreclosure or eviction after what, what was the date, March something? March, like 14th, I believe. Right, right, so you know, by the middle of March, uh, then uh, you would be impacted by this executive order. Okay, let's go to the second prompt. Okay. Uh, it only halts certain final actions and evictions. It does not cover tenants where the lease is expired. So like that question before, if the lease expired in February, that doesn't apply, or when non-payment occurs due to other reasons uh, besides COVID-19. It also does not apply to commercial properties or commercial loans. So that's very important also to make that distinction. Okay, let me, uh, let me go on to this next question here, which will, I think will lead us to the CDC. The CDC order talks about the tenant signing a certificate of COVID effect. Can this be filed after suit for eviction started or who has the burden of proof on, on this issue? Why don't we defer that question until we get there because I think it's a perfect question. Absolutely. Yes, so let me, uh, thank, thank you, Jerry, for asking time. that. Okay, next slide. All right. Okay, and right now, I mean, people, you know, just want not to have to pay their rent while, while they're you know, not working and, and you know, there's these are real social policy issues that we have to address as a nation. Next page. All right, these are the federal moratoriums that have been uh, now placed or extended through uh, the Federal Housing Financial Agency, which is the Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loans, HUD, which uh, governs the FHA loans and VA loans. The eviction and foreclosure moratorium is through December 31st, 2020. It only applies to properties that are single family mortgages that are backed by Fannie or Freddie or FHA or VA. Now this is important. So if it's a private investor, this does not apply. So if it's a securitized trust, if it's a John Doe who owns a property, that's not gonna apply for this. The if you're a mom are, and, right, so if you're a mom and pop owner of, of a multifamily, it wouldn't apply to you unless your loan was uh, exactly. from Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or, FHA. or if you're a lender, if you're like a, a private lender and you lend that money to uh, a, a, a mom and pop, and they then uh, could continue to collect rent, and they presumably uh, wouldn't uh, 
be affected by this federal moratorium. Is that correct? Correct. And, and, and the federal moratorium is also, it's important for the evictions. It only applies to single family homes that are owned, owned by Fannie, Freddie, FHA, or VA. So if it's owned by John Doe, who has it at Fannie or Freddie loan, that doesn't count. It has to be owned. So it's more like a bank owned property. Uh, there may be tenants still in there. But you could have a situation where it's a private lender lending to a mom and pop. The mom and pop is renting to a, a family and that family has been affected by COVID. They could, if, correct me if I'm wrong, use the CDC that we're about to talk to. We'll to go over CDC and correct that. That's okay. And so that would be an exception to the exceptions to the federal moratorium. So it gets complicated. That's why you got lawyers and that's why we're here to walk you through this. But there are always ways to deal with things. There's always light at the end of every tunnel. And that's what we learned in the last foreclosure crisis is that we gave people the hope that there would be another bright day in front of them. Next, next slide. All right, well, I'm gonna go over two more things. I'm oh, sorry. Mortgage servicers are directed to halt all new foreclosure actions and suspend foreclosure actions that are currently in process if you're one of these loans. That doesn't necessarily mean that the courts are going to agree with that. So if the court does something on their own, they're required to try and halt it, but it doesn't necessarily mean they can stop it completely. So I just want to make sure you guys are aware of that as well. All right, next is the CDC. Very interesting. The CDC on September 4th uh, came up with this order for a temporary halt in residential eviction, evictions to prevent the further spread of COVID-19. Okay, now this is good through December 31st, but you have to show if you're covered or not under this order that they made. You have to show, and there's an attestation that you basically have to file and, and send to your landlord under the penalties and perjury that you qualify. You have to show that you've made best efforts to obtain government rent assistance. You do not expect to make more than $99,000 in 2020 if you're filing single, or $198,000 if you're married or filing a joint return, or if you didn't report income in 2019, or if you received an EIP this year. You've experienced substantial loss of household income because of either layoff, reduced hours, or extraordinary out-of-pocket expenses or medical expenses. Um, you've also been able to make best efforts to try and make a partial payment uh, or as close to a full payment as possible. And being evicted would cause you to be become homeless or you have to move into a shared living setting, whether it's a uh, with other family or, or cramped quarters, but at least some place where you're not living by yourself. So that's very important. Now, if you file this, it could prevent a eviction from occurring for the next four months for you. So you, so you could file this as an anticipatory affidavit to your landlord as correct. a block to say, do not evict me, correct? That's correct. Okay, okay. And let's go to the next slide here because it's kind of interesting. And, and Jeff, can you make sure we post this on our website, These, you know, the, this, particularly these two slides so people can digest this because it's really a lot. Absolutely, to it's, it's very dense. However, it's very important to understand this. Okay, and, 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 this order does not affect people uh, where evictions were filed prior to September 4th, 2020. It's only affected from September 4th, 2020 to uh, December 31st. So it's only for this four month period. It only applies to residential properties. It does not include foreclosures on, mortgage, on home mortgages. So if you're evicted because of a, mortgage, a foreclosure, that doesn't count, okay? Persons can still be evicted by a landlord for other reasons other than non-payment of rent. So if your lease is expired, if you're conducting criminal activity, if there's health and safety issues or any other violation of your lease, the landlord can evict you. Okay, so this isn't a 100% a shield for you, for tenants. But it's a good enough shield that if you're being evicted after September 4th, that you call our firm so we can get an affidavit to your landlord or even do it before you're getting evicted. If you know you're behind on rent and you're being threatened, sending this affidavit ahead of time is a good move because if the landlord doesn't comply, Jeff, let's go over the criminal penalty and they are severe. Right. If a landlord doesn't comply with these um, with this order, they could receive a fine of up to $100,000 if it does not result in a death or one year in jail or both, or if it results in a death of, of the tenant, uh, they could be fined up to $250,000, one year in jail or both. That's if you're an individual landlord. If you're an organization, so you even have an LLC, a corp, or you're a bigger company, partnership, whatever it may be, you could be subject to a fine of no more than $200,000 if a violation does not result in the death or a fine of more than $500,000, no more than $500,000 if the violation results in a death. And the Department of Justice will be the one who will be in charge of enforcing these uh, violations. 
That's good. Is, there an attorney, is, is there an attorney fee provision here, which you could use from the lease possibly to, to, to collect fees? What do you think? It's possible. I, I had to look into it, Roy. Right. Wait, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good it's question. It's a brand new order. It came out September 4th, so it was not a lot. And anyway, it's, this is really early on, but we want you all to know that, that you know, the government is trying to find ways to, to make sure that, that the, the virus doesn't spread because people can't pay their rent. Um, and uh, some people are asking what our phone number is. You all should know our number. It's 954-384-6114. I'll repeat that, 954-384-6114. So you should call us. Uh, we will continue these discussions next week. Jeff, let's just go to the final slide here if we can. Um, and I, I know that uh, Jerry's question, I think we answered. Yeah, you can use a certificate as a way to, to, to stop the foreclosure, the, the evictions. And at the same time, you could use it to prevent it from occurring. In terms of evidence, there could be an evidentiary trial to determine if you really were impacted by, by COVID or not. And so that would be something that, that the trial judge would, would have to do. Uh, we will continue this topic uh, next week. I think next week we'll also talk about the new government relief program that, that apparently is going to be executed or signed in the next several days by, by, uh, by Congress and then signed by the president. I'm not sure what's in there, but there'll be a lot of stuff in there that will be helpful to all of us, whether you're a tenant, whether you're a landlord, whether you're an investor, whether you're a, a small business person. I'm, I'm sure there'll be stuff in there. So I'm going to thank Jeff for joining us. Jeff, maybe you'll join us again next week if you're, if, if you're available. And uh, I want to thank everyone for Zoom at noon, number 27. Is that right, Jeff? Today's number 27? That's correct. The number 27. So we'll see you all next week, same time for number 28. Have a great week. I hope everyone had a wonderful, wonderful Labor Day weekend. All the best. Thank you.